What's he? Okay, I have a lot of slides here, so I need to get a feel for what you want me to talk about. So, first off, could you raise your hand if you already know what the rice mapper is? Right, and if you don't know what the rice mapper is? Okay, I'll keep it a bit uh, more simple then. Okay, what is the rice mapper? Um, the other point I'll make is I've written quite a lot on the slides um, in case you can't all hear every word I say. Um, okay, so device mapper is a replacement for um, the logical volume manager that was in um, 2.4 kernels and 2.2. Um, the um, who uses logical volume management? LVM. Right, so I need to have some convincing to do as well. Who uses Fedora? Okay, different people. Debian? Yeah? Gen 2? Yeah? What for this? Slackware? Yeah? Herd? Herd. <laughs> Okay, so it's all about volume management, and the task here is to provide a generic component for volume management in the kernel, to keep it simple, to keep the interface as simple, and to push the complexity out to user space, um, where it's a lot easier to write code. Um, so, as you can see on the third, the third point, yeah, this is working. Um, so this, this was written in 2001, um, and it's been in the kernel now, must be a year and a half or so. And what it doesn't do is it doesn't know about the metadata, it doesn't know um, what volume groups are, groups of logical... Um, okay, I should start here. Who knows what a logical volume is? Right? Volume group... Yeah. So, a logical volume is a... Um, how do you describe a logical volume? Okay. You, if you've got... Why you would want to use volume management? Okay. Previously, you would use fdisk, partition your physical devices. So, we start off with a concept of the physical volume, and that corresponds to a disk. Um, if you are using fdisk, you would divide it into partitions. And the partitions correspond to logical volumes. So, when I say logical volume, it's like a partition. But it's a partition of not one disk. It's a partition spread across a group of disks. We take the physical volumes, we join them together into a volume group, and then we allocate partitions out of that total amount of space. But we no longer care which disk is being used for any particular piece of data. So, when I say um, what device mapper is and what device mapper is not, um, what device mapper in the kernel is doing is the logical volume. It's implementing a logical volume, just as the kernel previously implements partitions. And that's all it's doing. The more complicated business of joining the physical volumes together <coughs> into volume group, how to allocate space for new volumes, that's all done in user space. The kernel doesn't care about that. So this is a diagram showing how the logical volume manager is down here in user space and as with all good um, open source ideas you've got a choice you can use logical volume manager 2 which is what I work on or you can use EVMS which is what IBM work on um, device mapper is the kernel component that implements a logical volume and both of these talk to the kernel and do their work in user space we, on the LVM2 side, we have a user space library here, and this library hides the protocol between 
um, user space in Kerbal and wraps it in some easier to use um, library calls. DN Set Setup is a program that gives you complete access to um, the protocol between these two, these two layers here. So everything you can do with Device Mapper, you can do using a DM setup command on the, on the command line. But it just gives you the basics. LVM2 builds a lot around it, the concept of volume groups and so on. And similarly, <coughs> EVMS does. So, what have we got on the kernel? This is a diagram of device mapper, showing how all the different pieces of it that we've got today join together. And I've missed a few pieces off as well. Firstly, user space. That's what the previous <coughs> diagram was showing. I've put that all in a little blob here. The interface we use is IOCTM. Originally, um, there was a lot of discussion, should we use a file system interface to, to pass the control command to device mapper? Um, we started work on it, um, so we have both an IOCTL interface or a file system interface. You can choose which to use. We found very quickly that it was ten times faster to write code for the IOCTL interface than it was for the file system interface because of the constraints of reliability. Um, so we very quickly abandoned the file system interface. The code is still there. But the reason I left it in this diagram is because the architecture has separated the interface from the core with another layer. So we've got an extra layer in between here, which does the common things that are needed for both the IOC and TL interface or the file system interface. Now, if we decided we didn't need this piece, then these would have been the same, merged together. And so slowly this boundary is disappearing now, as we've abandoned this one. Separately, there is a block interface, and this is used when the I.O. is going through. Um, so the device mapper core, which I'll describe in more detail later. And then we have what's called a mapping or target interface. If we'd written it today, we'd have called them mapping. When it was written, they were called device mapper targets. So all the code refers to target, um, which is rather a puzzling name. It doesn't really describe what it's doing at all. Mapping is what it's doing. It's mapping data from one device to another device according to a set of rules. And here are some of the rules that you can use. Um, a linear mapping, which just says take these blocks from one device and map them linearly to these blocks on this device. Then with mirroring, obviously cloning the data between the two, snapshot, and multipath. How many people here are interested in, multi in multipath? <coughs> oh, fair enough. Right, I'll say a bit more about that later. Then. Multipath um, has four um, <coughs> modules at the moment, and these are going to grow in number over the next year. This is where all the activity is at the moment. KCopyD is a kernel service for copying data from one device to another. So Mirror needs to use this. Um, it's a separate kernel thread. Mirror says, I need to copy this data from here to here and asks K to copy to do it. When K copies to is finished, it calls back to Mirror and says, I finished. And then Mirror might decide to ask for some more to be copied. Okay. So, mapped devices, abbreviated to MD. Not to be confused with the other meaning of MD in the kernel of the software array. Um, a mapped device, is specified by a table saying how to map a range of logical sectors on the device um, using one of the mappings. This will become clearer later. It's a bit uh, compact. 
Uh, we use a B tree so that we can have very complicated mappings if necessary. So if you wanted to, you could replace all the span sectors on your device with sectors on another device uh, and just list individually the sectors that you wanted to replace. It's also been useful um, for people inter with uh, Windows interoperability in that Windows is capable of writing uh, partitions that start at an odd number of sectors into the device. And the existing uh, kernel code sort of assumes that things always start at even sensible positions, but Windows didn't do that. This doesn't care. This will let you have odd numbers of sectors. So, this is what I'd say about a table. You say where you want it to start, where it starts, how long it is, how you want to map it, linear, strands, whatever, and any details needed by that mapping. Throughout Device Mapper, we give sizes in sectors. We decided this early on. Uh, sector is always 512 bytes when we refer to a sector. So an example table <coughs> down here would say naught with a length of 32768 sectors, so that's what 16 megabytes, and then some mapping. And then the next line says for the next 16 megabytes of the device, I want some other mapping here. When we refer to devices, in the um, uh, tables, because if we have a linear mapping, we need to say what it maps onto. We have a choice, we could give its name, dev HDA, or we could give its major minor number. The advantage of the major minor is it saves us having to look up in the kernel what that major and minor corresponds to. Um, and given that a path name lookup could involve potentially going through several file system layers and um, potentially allocating memory, reading things off the disk even. It's, it's a lot more efficient to use this. These are some of the mappings that are available so far and the next few slides will take you through what you can do with them. The error mapping, a very simple one. It returns an error when any I.O. is passed to it. So this would allow you to um, replace a disk and make it appear unusable to your application. Not very useful. But if you've re genuinely lost a disk um, that's part of a larger logical volume or, or part of a, some software RAID, you might, may, maybe it's, uh, you've got 10 disks in this uh, volume, and you've just lost one of them, there might be something to begin <coughs> by still putting together the pieces from the other nine disks and replacing the missing one with errors. So you can then read um, directly. Or it may be more useful to replace them with zeros. So you can replace an arbitrary piece of disk with zeros. <coughs> For example, I can create a 16 terabyte device by using that table. <coughs> Even though I don't have real 16 terabytes, I can pretend I've got 16 terabytes of zeros. <coughs> and we'll use this one later on. <laughs> so a linear table here, start this length, write, um, <coughs> use um, um, HDA, and start from sector 384. So when you write to sector naught of this virtual device, this logical volume, that will translate to sector 384 on dev HDA. A striped mapping. So what we need here is a list of stripes. So if this is two-way stripe, two stripes, put a two here, list the two devices, starting from sector naught on each of them. Um, and this is saying how wide 
the stripes are to be. In this case, 256k. Again, always expressed in centers. So the question, you have to shout. Yeah. Ah. Right, this is a crypt. Um, so it encrypts the data that goes through it. It uses the kernel crypto API, so it doesn't have any encryption itself. It relies on the existing encryption and the kernel. You have to pass in all these parameters here. But there's a nice <coughs> tool to handle all that for you called Crypt Setup. Of course, you can see what the ciphers are from Prop Crypto. It's a block cipher, and you can vary the uh, block cipher by adding an initial vector. So this means you're not going to be using the same key for every block on your disk because that's not very really good from a cryptographic standpoint. So the default is what we call play, and it just adds the number of the sector um, to, uh, as the initial uh, vector. But there's been an enhancement recently called ESSIV, um, which is more a more complicated way of generating the IV um, and avoids some watermark problems with this because sector one, sector two, sector three, you just know the relationship between the initial vectors. It's better to jump all along a bit first. There's an option for chaining mode, but um, the only one available is uh, CBC. Um, the other one uh, doesn't use the initial vector, so it's just not secure. And you supply the key in X. So that's an example table uh, for this one. Snapshot. Okay, we'll get onto some pictures now. So snapshot samples the state of the device at a particular instant. So particularly useful for taking backups. If you try making a backup using tar, or by just reading through the file system and copying it to your backup media, you're going to find that the data is changing during the backup. And in the worst case, tar could be working down this bit of the file system, recording uh, to the backup, carry on down the next bit of the tree. Um, while that's happening, you might decide to move a directory from here, where tar hasn't got to yet, to somewhere where TAR has already finished backing up. So by the time TAR gets to the end, it never backed up your important directory because you moved it out of TAR's way. If you do this, it takes a snapshot at an instant. And then all the changes made after that um, are recorded so that it can recreate what the original uh, file system look like at that instant. So you have to set aside some space to um, record what happens when the, there are changes. Um, it doesn't make a complete copy, it just needs enough space to hold what's changing. So here is how we handle snapshots. First of all, you've got a logical volume and you're doing some reads and types through it. Uh, onto the physical volumes down here. Okay, and then we create a cow, copy on write. So this is going, whenever something is written here, it's going to make a copy of the old original data here before it lets this proceed. So what we have to do is put some layers ahead of the original devices. So the same I.O. is coming in here, but instead of going straight to logical volume 1, we have to intercept it, <coughs> and maybe we have to do, do something with it. Similarly, on this side, we have to trap any writes to the snapshot. So 
So we'll deal with read, first of all, very simple. We want to read something from here. Nothing's changed yet, so we can just read it straight up from the original base through the logical volume. If we want to read from the snapshot, it's the same. We can just read the data straight through the logical volume and read them. And at this point, both the snapshot and the original device are identical. Now, however, we write a block to their origin. So the origin says, has anything been written to this before? No. Ah, I'd better make a copy of it first. So it t tells the snapshot that um, something is about to be written to this device and exactly where. The snapshot then reads the data from the logical volume and writes a copy of it into the copy or write area. When it's finished, it tells the origin it's finished, and then the writes can proceed. And of course, if there was a subsequent write to the same piece of data, to the same area on disk, it can go straight through this time because it's already made a copy. So that's uh, the diagram pulling together the previous slide, showing all the arrows in one place. Now we want to write a block to the snapshot. Well, we just write it to the copy or write error. Um, we make a note of it. We don't have to look at the logical volume here at all. If we've already written to this place, well, we're just overwriting um, the data, and that's wrong, isn't it? No, that's right. Um, we're, if we're just overwriting the data that's already there. And if it hasn't, we just make a note that if there was a write to here to the same place, it wouldn't have to copy it. When we read the snapshot, we read it straight from the copy and write area, because it's been changed. Um, and that's a summary showing how the I.O. flows around the snapshot. If there's time, I'll show you some of these directly later. Um, if you have a second snapshot, it's completely independent. You, you can hear it back, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, okay. The, so the second snapshot is completely independent. It makes a second copy <coughs> of the changes. So if you have 10 snapshots, you have 10 copies. So it just doesn't scale. Um, and there is some work going on at the moment by Daniel Phillips to produce a version of this where all the snapshots share the same copy or write area. Next one, mirror. It just takes a copy of the data. We divide it into regions, fairly large, 512k, and we do all our accounting in terms of those regions. So we build up a little bitmap, say, uh, with one bit for every region, saying whether the regions are identical or out of sync. That bitmap could be in memory, or it could be on disk. And this is again, it's modular, so you can choose which you want to use. If it's a temporary mirror, you would use the core. If it's permanent, you would use this. Parameter lines are starting to get a bit more complicated now. And with multipath, it gets 10 times worse. Uh, but it's still nicer being in ASCII. So the disk log needs to know where am I writing this log, how big is the region, and when I start up, is the device already in sync or not? If it's already in sync, it just assumes the data is already identical on both devices. If it's not already in sync, it makes a copy in the background using kcopyd of all the data from the first device over to the second device. 
PV move uses mirror. PV move lets you move all the data off a physical volume. So if you want to remove a disk, and there is a logical volume on that disk, you first run PV move to tell it to move the data somewhere else in the volume group. So it breaks the data up into sections and then uses the mirror to move the data somewhere else. So originally your logical volume is on disk 1. Afterwards, your logical volume is on disk 2. The way you do it, you put a mirror in between, you insert a mirror. So the data is now going to here and here and K copy D is copying the data from here to here in the background. When it's finished, you take it away and you're back on PV2. Okay, a little bit on multipath. I don't know whether the uh, writing can be read right at the back, so I'll try and explain. The top half is kernel space and the bottom half is user space. Um, oh, I should say, do, does anybody need an explanation of what multipath is? Yeah? Okay. Sometimes, um, in high availability environments, you want to double up everything. You want two of everything. So if one of them fails, you've got another one that can carry on working. What multipath does is give you multiple paths to the same disk. So you might put two separate disk, disk cards in your machine, two separate cables from there to the, to the disks. And typically you're using fiber channel, uh, you may be using fiber channel switches, fiber channel cards. It's usually quite expensive uh, equipment. But these days it can be cheaper. You can use iSCSI. Um, so you can have your disk on one machine and export SCSI commands over IP to another machine. So your disk can appear to be local. Okay, so device mapper is this block here. In kernel space, of course. Your, your low-level disk drivers are up here. When a new device appears, so a new disk is plugged in, or a new cable is plugged in, or uh, something that wasn't working has been fixed. We use SysFS and the hot plug mechanism to tell user space that a new device has appeared. And a daemon here called Monopath is scanning, scans um, the devices, looks at a configuration file, and decides what to tell, how to set up device mapper uh, to know about multiple paths. So the I/O will be sent down one path. Multipath D, uh, device mapper will decide which path to send it down. If it's an error, it gets an error, then it will retry it down a different path, and it will carry on until it's no paths left. And I've got a demonstration of this later. Sparse device. This is where we can use our around 16 terabyte zero device. I can now create a 16 terabyte file system, even if I've only got, say, a few tens of megabytes. I can take a snapshot of a zero device and then write to the snapshot. So this gives me a sparse device. If I, it only holds. It's, it only writes the data that I write to it. So as long as I don't write more than 10 megabytes to it, the location of those 10 megabytes can be anywhere within this 16 terabyte uh, address space. Or of course on 64 bit, I can go a lot bigger. Right. <coughs> A bit more about the IOCTL interface. I'll probably go through this a bit faster now. Um, it's it's a, lot more, a lot more for the uh, programmers. And then get on to the, some examples 
uh, towards the end. So it communicates with an IFCTL through a MISC control device, normal major number 10, minus 63, but the 63 is dynamic, so you have to create a device that can control uh, yourself originally. January this year, we finally added some code, added some logic to live death mapper so that it would create this device automatically if it wasn't there. And if it was there and have the wrong minor number, it would fix it. So the hacks that the likes of uh, Fedora have to do to create the death mapper control aren't necessary anymore. It's restricted to root. Only root can create logical volumes at the budget. As Alan was saying earlier, this means we don't have to be as careful about security as we would have to be otherwise. Um, there are some things we do which, if non-root users could use the IOCTL, uh, we have to change and put extra restrictions in. <laughs> The actual payload of information passed between user space and the kernel, the request, um, it's a variable size because these tables can be huge. We don't know in advance how big it's going to be. If user space is asking the kernel, what is the table at the moment? What, what is my current set of mappings? Then it has to create enough space in advance for the kernel to fill in. And if there isn't enough space, then you get this flag, DM buffer full set. And user space should then retry with a larger buffer. We had to put a lot of care into the versioning. <coughs> we, at the time we were originally writing this, lots of people had problems with the previous version of LVM. In the previous version of LVM, the version number of the user space code had got to match the version number of the kernel code. Because the interface was often changed. Whenever the interface was changed, the two wouldn't work. This was a problem if you were upgrading your kernel and you wanted to switch between two kernels. Sometimes you wanted to boot with one kernel, other times with another. You had to keep changing your user space utilities according to what kernel was that. So instead of that, we put a much more flexible uh, versioning system in. And lib dev mapper in user space does all the work to make sure the right version of the IFCTL calls is used. So the first command available is dm version, and this just tells you the version number. And we, we guarantee that this will continue to work, even if we change the major number. If we make significant changes to the interface in the future, all the version number looks at is the first little bit of the request structure. Um, so if we extend it in future, that goes at the end. And all you have to do is change the major, increase the major number, and it will look at this and say, oh, the major numbers are different, I can't do anything. And then it's up to live the dead map and to say, oh, well, the major number is something different. If I know how to use that different major number, I'll try that. List versions shows you the targets available, so whether you've got linear, striped, multi-path, it tells you what is currently loaded in the kernel together with version numbers again. If you want to create a new device, you have to give it a name, which can be up to 127 characters, or a UUID, which could be up to 128 characters. Um, for some reason, there's a difference of one here. Um, something to do with a trailing null, and arguably a typo, but it's too late to fix it. You can 
fix the major and minor number, if you wish, but you don't have to. It will allocate one dynamically, but in some cases, like if you've got NFS servers that give out the major number, uh, minor, the minor number rather, in the um, um, handle, then you may want, and you're using failover, you may want to have the same minor numbers on both um, systems that you fail over to. And they can be read only. You have three ways of referencing devices. You've got the name, the UUID, or the major minor number and you can choose. Device number is meant for the user, so that should be something nice and readable. For example, the volume group and logical volume name. The UUID is meant for the system, meant to be unique, and once you've created a device, there is no way of changing it. So you can guarantee that if an application does queries on the same UUID, it will get back the same device. And device number is also unique. Of course, if you can create it, you can remove it. Um, and there's some nastiness still in here. For testing, we have a remove all option that deletes everything. You can rename but you can't change the UUID. Obviously get a list of the devices. And then you've got to be able to load the mappings. So we, we now have two slots for mappings, an active and an inactive one. When you load a table up, it goes into the inactive slot first. And if there's already one in that slot, it gets replaced. You can, of course, clear what's in that inactive slot. And then the main mechanism for changing the mapping of a device is suspend and resume. If you suspend the device, it will queue all the I.O. being sent to it. So if you spend, suspend the device mapper device, the I.O. stops at the device mapper layer and it waits while you're making all these changes. If there's any I.O. still on its way to the disk, waiting to be completed, waiting to come back from the disk, then it waits until that's all finished. So there's no I.O. happening below that layer. If you have a file system involved, such as XFS, it tells the file system to freeze, and that means the file system will stop processing operations, the file system will make sure its journal is up to date and everything is clean were you to FSCK it. So when you take the snapshot, in principle if all this has worked, your snapshot will not need an FSCK, but it will mount clean. And the final thing that a resume will do is move the inactive table into the active slot. So it will, by resuming a device, it makes the device active with a new table. Yes, Paul? Um, it's not an enterprise feature, but is this a better way of doing uh, laptop mode guaranteeing that the disk doesn't spin back up and still keep doing consistent classes? Of doing laptop? Laptop. Um, you should you should freeze before doing that. Yes, yeah. And there are there are plenty of other examples where this is this is useful. Um, if you temporarily want to uh, suspend something, but you can do that by calling the freeze directly. You don't have to do it through device mapper. There are other uses of device mapper on things like um, if you're distributing some an operating system to number of machines in the cluster uh, or des desktops and you want them all to have the same file system image of them, read-only file system, thin clients. You can use a snapshot type mechanism 
from updating and then switching between the old file system and the new file system. We know. Yep. It gets queued in memory, yes. If there's not enough memory, you start having problems. <laughs> so firstly, if you're doing this, you want to do it for a very short time. If, unless you've got lots of memory, you, you want to suspend and resume for the shortest possible time. <coughs> the reason, well, you, you, have to, you have to try it. Um, Yes, it, it uses memory, and the release of LVM2 was delayed for about two months, fixing this particular problem for PVMove. Because PVMove would hang the system if you had no memory life. I don't believe it does today. So we've got, um, we used to have an info call, which gives you the basic information about the device. Is it active? Has it got a table? Um, is it read-only? But we found that this was being called so many times, a bit like stat. Um, we decided instead to build it into the other commands. So when the other commands return, they fill these fields in instead. So you don't have to call this specially. And the only caveat to that is um, BD, uh, BD open, the open count. We return how many uh, times uh, the device is referenced. For example, if it's mounted, that counts as one. But it turns out to do that, you have to take a lock. And this was affecting performance. So we made this optional now. Uh, but did it backwardly compatible, so you set a flag to set, the new software sets a flag to say, I don't need this information, skip that bit. So we have the status command, and this is aimed at the targets. It means a mirror can return information saying I'm 50% of the way through my copy. Snapshot can say I'm 90% full, and you can monitor that and suggest that you need to make a bit more space available. We have a very, very primitive signaling mechanism um, to tell the user space that something important happened. It doesn't say what, but it means user space doesn't have to keep holding the kernel to say, you know, are you ready yet? Are you ready yet? Are you ready yet? It can just sleep. And when an event happens, it will be woken up, and then it can go and check what really happened, check the status. Um, but this, this was just something to start with. It could be replaced with something more complicated, like an equipment eventually. This, this one, as far as I know, is none of us use it, but it seemed a good idea at the time. It gives you a list of all the devices referenced um, by another device. So ignoring all the mappings in there, mirror, snapshot, regardless of the complexity, it just gives you a simple list saying this uses HDA, HDB, HDC. It just tell, gives you a list of the devices used without any more information. And then we have recently added a message and basically passes an ASCII string to one of the targets. So we need this in multipath. Um, after a path has failed, we need users, and it comes back again. User space has to tell the multipath target that the path is available again. So it sends it a little message like this, and I'll show you that in a few minutes. Libdev map, who I mentioned earlier, the tools, I've mentioned LVM2, EVMS, DM setup is this one. So you just have commands like DM setup version, DM setup create, ls, and one of the more recent ones, DM setup info dash c, which gives you column based output. 
logical volume man management. Um, I'm going to skip through these slides a bit now because we're rather short of time. This was a separate sort of one hour talk uh, just uh, slipped in why you might want to use logical volume management. But you can read the slides on the web afterwards. Why we went to LVM2. Some of the recent LVM2 extensions. PV move is implemented a different way from LVM1. It works because it tells device mapper, you need to copy this data from here to there. Device mapper gets on and does it. When it's, and it uses this event mechanism for polling. So you have a choice. If you use something like this, dash I5, that means ask the kernel every five seconds, have you finished yet? And the kernel might say yes or no and tell you how far it's got. So that gives you a, a, a display of how far it's got with a copy every five seconds. And of course, you use a different number instead of five. If you leave that out, or I think it's I0 or something, instead it will just poll. It asks the kernel once, wait me up when you're finished. <coughs> if your machine dies during the copy, well, the, the move is being done by um, this mirror target with an in-core log. So the information about what's been copied and what hasn't is all in memory. But it breaks it down into pieces. And once the first piece is finished, user space, PV move wakes up and writes to disk, OK, that piece is finished. It tells the kernel to get on with the next piece. So this means that you can lose power on the machine, reboot, and the PV move will carry on approximately from where it was before. We'll just go back to the last checkpoint. Sorry? Um, Semi-automatic So you have to run VG, if you run VG change AY to activate the volume group, part of activating the volume group is to continue with the PV move. Alternatively, if you do it by hand, you could just say PV move dev SPD without any more parameters if that's what it was. And it would spot, oh, there's already a PV move SPD. Obviously, that's the one you want me to carry on running, not a new one. And then this one, LV create the new type argument, gives you access at the moment to the zero and the error type. So you can create a segment um, block of zero, a block of zeros in a logical volume using this. Um, and in the future, this will be expanded to some other types. For example, clustered mirrors and clustered snapshots will appear as different um, type arguments here. Okay, those are the enhancements in LVM2. I'm going to go right across those. What the new metadata looks like on LVM2, I'll skip that. Um, some links, I think that slide one is in the wrong place. No, it's at this right, I finished on that. Yeah. Um, so the mail list, Christoph Sauer has done the uh, crypto. So the mail list, the mail list for crypto target, the encrypt, is at that address. There are links to everything from here. That's the main website for device number. Yeah, the encrypt. Christoph Faraki is the, um, he has got the site for multi-path. The slides will go up at this URL and be linked to there uh, after the uh, event is over and I've got back home. Um, and then there's the obligatory advert for a conference in uh, Swansea that I organised. Um, uh, looking for uh, speakers who fancy a few days in South Wales. Right, so I'll now. Uh, demonstrate uh, some of this. So what I've got here, if the network is behaving, which it isn't. Has everyone got networking here at the moment? Yeah? So it should be working. Yeah. 
so it's just uh, uh, I've got a logic, logical volume naught, um, logical volume naught, um, major and minor number like that. I've got a couple of crypt, crypt devices um, and some modes of path underneath. If I use DM setup um, info dash C, Some of these are rather long names, so they've wrapped around it. But you can see it gives you the major number, the minor number, the status, and you can look up the command page what these symbols mean. But basically, the L means there's a live table there, the W means it's right of all them. Um, the open counts, each of them has got one thing using it at the moment, reference count. They're very simple targets, just one. Um, and the, the events, I didn't say, but the events are all numbered, so you can avoid erasing conditions if you don't want to. Right, now let's look at the tables. Oh, I should, yeah, I should say, if you run into without the dash C, you get a more descriptive version. It just goes off the top of the screen. Alistair. Alistair, could you show us what's in slash dev slash mapper, just out of interest? Oh, yes, dev mapper, yeah. Yeah, so these are the block devices that are up here. And you can see the control device control there. Right, the set of the table, this shows me what the mappings actually are. Right, not very well laid out, but you can see that the first one is logical volume, it's pretty big. Uh, I think that's about two terabytes or something. It's striped. Um, across two devices, the major and minor numbers are here. So minor numbers are two and three. Um, it's now gone off the top of the screen, but um, two and three are actually the crypt targets down here. So that is striped across some encrypted devices. They're encrypted with um, advanced encryption standard um, over devices. 253 minor number 1 and minor number 0. And that's the key that's used for the encryption. We don't hide it. If you root, you can put it in, you can take it out. And I think it's quite right that it should be visible like that. Um, because it, what, it reminds people that the key is present in the kernel all the time, that you are using that encrypted device. So it is easily obtained. So the only way of getting rid of the key is to disable the device, unmount the file system. Okay, so then we've got two multipath devices underneath all that. So what I've got is multipath with crypt on top, um, with stripes on top of that, with a logical volume, and a file system on top of that. So I've stacked up quite a few layers. I didn't put a snapshot in, but I thought that, was, that would be enough. Um, the multipath, you can see the arguments are much more complicated. And if you're not a computer program, it's, you don't want to start reading all those. You want them displayed. There's a status command, 345 status. Um, it's to be finished in a minute. Um, and this one, again, it, it's pretty difficult to work out what all those are, but A means it's active. Oh, also, that tells me all the paths are active. So instead, there's a two. Um, yeah, wake up. There we go. 
There's a tool that interprets it for you. Ignore video error messages. Yeah. So this, this tells me more clearly that I've got four multipath devices in there. It sends the I.O. round them, round robin, and it's using these four first. If those four paths were all to fail, then it would start using the second group instead and switch to that group automatically. Um, if I put the I.O. stat on again, you can see that there's um, stuff happening on the various devices. Um, if I can <coughs> stop. If I kill multipath B, so the paths won't be automatically enabled, I can do DM setup and find it. use the message command to tell multipath to fail a device. Okay, so if I now run multipath again, well, that hasn't worked. That hasn't worked. It was supposed to show some of the devices have failed. I bet multipath B is just not enough again, and uh, automatically re the path because it's still there. <laughs> But if we actually pulled the cable out, that would be good. Okay, any questions? Yeah. Yeah, the next speaker wants to come and set up. Yeah. You can use different keys. Yes, definitely. Yeah, you can. Well, any one volume you use at the same time, of course, but you could, you could split a volume in half and use one key for the first half and a different key for the second half. If you wanted to change, so if, could you change your key on the volume, basically? Yes, you could change the key on the volume by, um, and the, the way to do it is like PB movements. Slowly move the set of the mirror between the devices. Take one section of the file first, get it mirrored between the device with one key and the device with a new key. When it's finished mirroring, use the new instead of the old and move on to the next section. And you can use, yeah. Yeah, you can start with the volume not encrypted and do it. Um, I think someone has written a tool to do that. There's a link from the Crypt um, web page for that. Okay, and over to Pat.